course, today I'm going to, uh, of course, uh, continue lecturing. Uh, I am going to um, finish up, like I said, the Old West first. I'll do that first. Uh, and then um, I, I'm going to review a little. I got I to review. I, haven't, I didn't do that last class, I know, because uh, they're kind of like not quite finished with the Old West. But I'm going to review uh, of that, um, of the Old West section. And then whatever time we have left, I should have enough time. I'll get into the rise of um, like industrialization in America in the late 19th century. Now, of course, at the beginning of that video, I told you, I showed you the fact that, you know, uh, one of the big things that's going on uh, in the Old West at the end of it is the settlement of it, which happens very quickly in a matter of just so many few decades. I think really in about 30 year period from 1870 to uh, 1900, um, the West is settled very fast. Uh, and um, if you study about before that, going back to like Jamestown in 1607, when they English set up the first colony, uh, from 1607 to 1870, about maybe 400 million acres were settled or so. And they believe in like a 30 year period that that doubled, that basically about I think it's like 430 million uh, acres were settled at one point uh, up to about 1900. And of course, the Homestead Act, more than half of it was settled using that. Uh, and the Homestead Act was an act passed under Abraham Lincoln. Uh, it was part of it was to get more support from the North and the Union side. And what it did was it allowed um, any Northerner who hadn't fought against the Confederacy uh, to claim free land uh, in the United States that was just not occupied. And so they, they you could get like 160 acres of free land, and all you had to do is pay some kind of filing fee for it if you had the money for that. Uh, and um, so he said, like, they, they said like something like um, over a million people tried. It's like Kenneth is joining. Hey, Kenneth. Uh, and uh, so we're talking about the Homestead Act. And so, yeah, close to over a million people tried to get this land as homesteaders uh, in the Old West. Uh, of course, when they got there, they found out that, you know, the Great Plains area was mostly a desert area. Now, not too many trees there, you know. Uh, so a lot of them had to build what they call sod houses. So, sod house is a type of house where they built a structure to it, but they put sod on the roof, sod between the, I guess, the joints and all that uh, on, on the building of it. And so that was the typical kind of house that people built in the 19th century uh, in the Old West. And um, a lot of people that became uh, homesteaders were sometimes called sod busters because uh, they built these sod houses. And um, they're part of the reason why the long drive and the cowboy declined, like we, we, which we talked about from last class. Uh, there was a lot of confl conflicts between the uh, homesteaders, sod, sod busters, you know, versus the people that wanted to have like the open range. And so the open range would eventually end uh, because of the Homestead Act. Uh, they also found out there was a lot of water problems when they went out to the Old West, lack of water, like if you weren't near a river or something, that, that created a lot of problems. So a lot of people had to like, you know, have like dig wells or have windmills that would, you know, pump water up the ground. That's how you got your water um, in a lot of cases. So Homestead Act was pretty important. You saw in that video, I showed you that they, at one point, they think that up to 270 million people uh, may have eventually at one point filed uh, for these homesteads. And that's how many acres was eventually, you know, settled because of it, uh, because of the Homestead Act. Uh, anybody could participate, you know, uh, unless you were for the, unless you'd fought for the Confederacy, you know, I think you couldn't do it. But um, pretty much a lot of immigrants uh, were homesteaders: uh, Germans, Swedes, Russians, Danes, Norwegians, uh, African Americans also claimed land uh, in the Old West. Uh, a lot of people from New England left too. New England and came westward. 
on stuff like that. A lot of immigrants, though, went westward on stuff like that. Uh, also, it helped, to, I don't have it in there, but another thing it helped to also um, sell the old west was the development of railroads. They built railroads all over the west. Uh, back by the 1880s, there were five transcontinental railroads that linked the east to the west, part of the United States. And so a lot of people settled near railroad towns, you know about that, um, which is where a lot of people settled originally. Or like mining towns, but you know a lot of them were probably connected with railroads, um, also as well. Uh, they had to figure out. Oh, here, here's another thing too, showing you a little more information about the homestead. Yeah, there was a minimum age, by the way. You had to be at least 21 years old. So yeah, um, so if you could obviously be younger. Uh, there was a certain age uh, requirement, of course, for it. Uh, head of household usually had to you know do it. Uh, of course, you had to be a citizen or at least intending that you're going to become a citizen uh, before you get it. The land itself was free, uh, but you had to pay some kind of filing fee for it. So, oh, another thing, too, about the Homestead Act. You must live on the land and improve the land for five years to make the land officially yours. So for some reason you can't stay on the land and improve the land. You lost your land. And so you saw in the video only about 40% succeeded. Why was it so hard? Well, because of the Great Plains, the way it was, it was hard to make a living, grow crops sometimes. Also, they had to deal with Indians, wild Indians attacking them, uh, drought, grasshopper plagues, bitter cold, blizzards, you know, you name it. Uh, and so that made it very difficult. Uh, however, they did develop new techniques for farming, which is often called dry farming, as they called it. In homesteaders, what they did was when it would rain or when they would have like frost or snow, whatever, uh, they would plow the land uh, so that the uh, a layer of soil would be on top of the, the moisture. Uh, that would trap it in there so they could you know help grow crops later. And that's how the technique of dry farming mostly worked. Uh, besides dry farming techniques, uh, another thing that was important too in the West uh, was that because of the Industrial Revolution uh, that started back in the 18th century, they were able to get new mechanical stuff to make farming easier. So you got, you know, this whole industrialized farming taking off. So you got seed drills, which were mechanical machines that would plant seed. Um, instead of by hand, steel plows like John Deere. John Deere was one of the first, of course, to develop steel plow, like in America. Mechanical reapers, uh, which harvest um, like grain crops, like wheat, barley, uh, etc. Windmills to pump water out the ground. Threshing machines. What's a threshing machine? Threshing machine is a type of machine that separates the seed from the stalk of the grain. Um, mechanical binder is a type of um, machine that uh, binds together like um, like a crop, like weed or whatever, in bundles. Um, so, so all these different new techniques, of course, were you know, developed, you know, which are important. And that made farming, you know, a lot easier. All right, yeah, let me get into, the, so of course, the so-called last frontier, which, of course, we got later, of course, which we'll get more into. And this is, of course, where, uh, a lot of the parts of like the United States were like in the lower 48 were settled last, like the last areas. Uh, one of the last areas settled was Oklahoma Territory, which was originally called the Indian Territory, uh, which was settled around 1889. Uh, and if you know about this, a long time ago, uh, the area of Oklahoma was used as an area for a lot of the, the so-called um, five civilized tribes uh, to settle there, which those tribes, by the way, uh, were the um, were the five. They're uh, the Cherokee, the Creek Indians, Chickasaw, Choctaw, and Seminoles. So all those were sent there, of course, because of the Trail of Tears and Andrew Jackson. Um, and eventually there was a deal made between them and the U.S. government to free up about 2 million acres, which was somewhere in, was in central Oklahoma. Uh, and so the 1880s, the first 
uh, settlers, like American settlers, moved in there uh, to take up free land, you know, based off of the Homestead Act. Uh, and so um, what happened was you had two different people that came in there. You had what they call the, um, they had what they call boomers. And boomers, uh, Oklahoma boomers were these um, settlers that came in. They grabbed up, you can see, two million acres of land. Uh, in Oklahoma, uh, there was some land left, well, if you know that, uh, which um, they were going to give away, uh, which was under President Benjamin Harrison, which was in April of um, 1889. It was called the Oklahoma Land Rush. Uh, and um, a bunch of people showed up, uh, of course, to, to grab the land. And there were some that went in there early, if you know about it, that snuck in, uh, took some of the best land, and they were called Oklahoma Sooners. And so that's hence where the name came from. So a boomer was somebody who came in and settled, I think, starting back in the 1880s and starting homesteads and all that. Then Sooners were these people that snuck in and took the last land that was the best. Uh, another thing, too, I need to mention about, too, that's very famous uh, in American history of the Old West uh, is the Morrill Act was created uh, in the 1860s and 90s, it was two acts, one in 1862, there was one in 1890. Uh, both these were federal grants that were given out to create A&M schools, agricultural, military type, mechanical type schools uh, overall. And uh, they're called land grant colleges, if you know about this. And um, the first one created a lot of these universities, of course, heard of like LSU as an example of one that was a land grant college that was created, Mississippi State University, Texas A&M. Um, and the guy that created it was this man named Justin Smith Morrill, who was a senator from Vermont. He created both acts and they got named after him. Uh, and uh, then that other one here, the second Morrill Act of 1890, uh, it gave federal uh, grants to create land grant colleges for African-Americans. So like Southern University, you know, Baton Rouge area, you know, uh, is an example of that kind of college that was created uh, because of the Moral Act of 1890. So probably know about that, hopefully. So that's just kind of something important. And uh, part of why they created these, um, like these college universities was they were trying to teach people how to farm mechanical arts and things like that. Uh, Cause a lot of people came to the West, Western part of the United States, they knew nothing about doing this kind of stuff, you know, to make a living. So that's why they created all this. Not that everybody's going to be farmers, but that back in the day, that's what mostly people did the most. Oh, another thing that was created, too, um, also was, that helped the Old West out, too, was the USDA was created, uh, Department of, U.S. Department of Agriculture, created in 1862, uh, by Abraham Lincoln, uh, and um, this was founded uh, as part of an executive branch of the United States. On uh, what it did was it basically helped helped uh, and regulate like agriculture uh, throughout the United States. Helps farmers, helps ranchers, uh, the farming community, uh, forestry. It's involved in forestry as well. Uh, also, they inspect like meat and food products and and things like that uh, as well. So the U.S. Day is still around. It's very important. It was something that was, you know, helped a lot the, the West as well uh, overall. Uh, then one more thing, of course, I'll talk about too. Uh, also, they had the last frontier. Yeah, you know, what was that area? Well, in the lower 48, most of the area that was the last frontier uh, was really in New Mexico, Arizona. That was the areas that were Really the last to be settled, the last uh, states to form uh, in the lower 48. Uh, 1890, the superintendent of, of the Census Bureau made a significant statement. He said, up to including 1880, the country had a frontier settlement, but at present in 1890, the unsettled area has been so broken into by isolated bodies of settlement that there can hardly be said to be a frontier line anymore. So, so yeah, about 1890, people will start realizing there's no more frontier much, you know, 
uh, even the old West with all the outlaws and all that, you know, like was it Butch Cassidy and Sundance kid realized that oh, they got to, it's not here to rob no more. So we got to go to Bolivia, you know, or something like that. And so they went to South America. So uh, between 1867 and 1912, uh, there were 12 new states that came into the um, Union um, in the lower 48. Uh, Nebraska became a state in 1867. Colorado became a state in 1876. North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, and Washington State became states in 1889. Idaho and Wyoming became a state, both of those, in 1890. Utah became a state in 1896. Oklahoma, when we were talking about earlier, became a state in 1907. Now, these two you see here, of course, which New Mexico and Arizona were the last two states to form, of course, in the lower 48 in 1912. So actually, they were one territory at one point, um, you see right here, which was called the New Mex Mexico Territory, which is right here. They divided up into two states, you can see there with the different cities, um, and they became states in 1912. Uh, of course, two more later, that'll be added later. I don't know if you know, of course, you probably know this, but Alaska and Hawaii became the 49th and 50th states in 1959. So they'll be later uh, when they're added. Uh, but that's all the 50 states. But up to 1912, there were only 48 uh, at this point. So that's pretty much it about talking about, you know, the Old West uh, in general. Uh, let me go ahead and review uh, over this period we we're talking about. I'll kind of go back from the last class uh, and talk about it. So we first talked about the Great West or the Old West. It's called all kinds of names uh, or just the Wild West. I think it was what some people called it. It's called all kinds of names. And we talked about how the Great Plains was mostly the area of the Old West, uh, which was settled. And it was called the Great American Desert. It was one of the nicknames that Zebulon Pike called it. And I told you about how Pike explored Colorado and found Pike's Peak. And I told you before about how Lewis and Clark were some of the first to explore the West, like in the northern part, northern part of the Old West, like Montana and that area. Uh, and uh, they call it the Great American Desert because the Great Plains didn't have any trees and all that. And they thought you couldn't grow anything there, but you can. You can like wheat and other, like I think they grow a lot of wheat and corn. Now, the main things I think they grow, I know in the Upper Plains, I know a lot. And um, then we talked about the Great Plains Indians, uh, all the different Plains Indians. I told you there was a bunch of them, uh, of the Plains Indians uh, that were famous. Uh, I'll kind of go through them again and, and if you remember these, but the Sioux, Blackfoot, the Crow, the Cheyenne, Pawnee, Arapaho, uh, Wichita, Kiowa, Comanche. Uh, those are some of the main ones that were part of the Great Plains Indians. Uh, they were very famous. And, of course, they relied heavily on, if you remember correctly, horse culture. They had to, you know, which came from the Europeans originally, like the Spanish that came over. And uh, so they used horse to hunt animals, especially buffalo. Buffalo was, you know, the most important thing um, that really, you know, um, led to um, why their culture succeeded. Because they used the buffalo as a natural resource, not only for food, uh, but for clothing, teepees, uh, and any kind of tools, weapons they could make out of it. Uh, there were different American policies, of course, against the you know the Indians. As you know, the destruction of the Buffalo, the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, a lot of that led to the end of the Indian culture of the Great Plains Indians. Uh, at first, they tried concentration. You know, like Andrew Jackson pushed all the Indians west of the Mississippi River, uh, and then what happened was they decided what we're going to do with the Native Americans. We're going to put them on federal reservations. And that's what, you know, causes all that. And so that leads to the Indian Wars uh, because of, you know, those three policies. The the, uh, the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, destruction of the Buffalo, uh, and, of course, the forcing them on reservations. So someone wanted to fight, you know, and try to stop all that. And so the first one was after, you know, the Civil War. You had the Red Cloud Wars that broke out 
remember, because uh, along the Bozeman Trail, uh, which was going into Montana, where they had those gold fields there, uh, Red Cloud fought against uh, the American U.S. forces, and um, we lost. The U.S. government lost. We signed the, the Treaty of Fort Laramie, which gave uh, the Sioux, who uh, Red Cloud, you know, led, uh, gave the Sioux like basically South Dakota, the western part, and also the famous Black Hills. Now, there is believed to be there. It's very sacred to them. Uh, we talked about Custer. Custer, you know, was this um, general of the Seventh Cavalry uh, that was sent to force the uh, Indians back on their reservations. Remember, he was famous for the Battle of Washita. Uh, where some people claim he committed atrocities against the Cheyenne Indians. Uh, the battle, the Little Bighorn, was the peak battle of the whole uh, Indian Wars at the Civil War, uh, which took place in June 25th to 26, 1876, in Montana. Seventh Army fought. Seventh Cavalry fought against um, what is basically a combined force of Sioux and mostly Cheyenne, uh, who were led by Sitting Bull, of course, a famous uh, chief and, and medicine man. And also they had the warrior, uh, Indian warrior, of course, Crazy Horse was under them. And of course, you know what happened, right? Because you probably hope, hopefully have seen the video already, uh, watched it, but um, the documentary I gave you, but Custer's forces got wiped out. Uh, and so it kind of looks bad for you know the U.S. side. That's what angered the United States, and they think that the whole battle, Little Bighorn, actually, even though it was the greatest victory of the Indians, led really to the end of the of, of the Indian struggle, and they were forced back on reservations. Uh, wounded Knee, often called different names, Battle of Wounded Knee, Battle, of course, of also called Wounded Knee Massacre, is what the Sioux called it. That happened in eight, December 1890, and that was an incident where Seventh Cavalry uh, killed men, women, and children like in a massacre because uh, they thought they were trying to attack them, uh, but they were really just being disarmed on a reservation there. And a lot of them were uh, trying to, uh, or they think they were trying to revolt uh, against the Americans again uh, because of the popularity of the Indian um, revival movement that was called the ghost dance. The ghost dance was this movement where Indians believed they did this dance, which wore like special kind of ghost shirts, I think they were called, uh, that that what would happen was that the buffalo would all return and the um, all the, the American settlers would disappear. They'd get their land back and all that. Setting Bull was involved with it and he later was arrested and they killed him. By accident. I think he was killed by Indian police. Um, and of course, we talked about how the Indians were, you know, they tried to Americanize them, you know, make them like into like civilized Americans, cut their hair, make them Christians, uh, which somewhat worked and then somewhat with a failure as well. Uh, Century of Dishonor was a book I told you by the writer and author Helen Hunt Jackson. Uh, she was one of the first. Americans to write a book about how the uh, American government had mistreated uh, the Indians, how they'd broken all their treaties with them and stolen their land. Uh, and so it un un uncovered all the abuses of the U.S. government and probably the um, Department of Interior, uh, which dealt with the Indians and all that. Uh, it led to some reforms, which some worked, some didn't. Uh, of course, some of these were like the Dawes Act, Burke Act of 1887-1906. What that did was it created the idea of homesteads uh, for the American Indians uh, where they could get so much land, like 160 acres, uh, et cetera, uh, just like other homesteaders could because they weren't considered official citizens. Remember, you had to be a citizen to file under the Homestead Act. So this allowed them to basically file like their own version of the Homestead Act, but the only problem with this act was that, the other, the other one, Burke Act later, is that a lot of the land that they gave the Indians, they couldn't really do much with it because it was just terrible land. They were given like the worst land. Uh, and so 
uh, or that speculators would come in and steal their land from them because they had to stay on the land for 25 years instead of five. So it's really difficult. Uh, then we talked about the cattle drives, the cowboy, uh, of course. Uh, that was fueled by the cattle industry in the east, like the slaughterhouses in Chicago, St. Louis. And so uh, cowboys developed in the 1860s and peaked up to the 1880s. And the earliest cowboys were actually Mexican. Uh, they came from Mexico or Texas. They were called vaquero, vaqueros. Uh, and uh, so you had Mexican cowboys at first. And yeah, you're, you know, white Texans. And then, of course, Africans, African-Americans uh, were also cowboys uh, as well uh, that were involved. So I told you it's kind of a mix of different racial groups uh, that were cowboys, so black, you know, Indian and white. Um, what was the long drive? The long drive uh, was where they uh, drove the uh, Indian, uh, they drove the um the cattle up to uh, what are um, cow towns uh, that are basically uh, in the um, are in the old west, like uh, in the Midwest anyway, uh, and um, the um, like Abilene, Kansas, Dodge City, and um, there's another one there, Colorado. The head that was big. Um, I couldn't remember that one. But Dodge City, Tombstone, you may have heard of that one. Abilene, not Tombstone. Uh, Abilene, Kansas City. Kansas City was a big one where they shipped them to because Kansas City had a lot of slaughterhouses to know. Uh, Deadwood, South Dakota, that was another one. They also sent them to. There's a bunch of places up there where they sent them to where they had railroads and then they would ship them east, uh, the cattle. Uh, there are four different uh, cattle trails that were big uh, early on. Uh, told you about uh, the um, first one was the Chisholm Trail, founded by Jesse Chisholm. Uh, the Shawnee Trail, Western Trail. They had that one that was founded by two cowboys called the Goodnight Lovin' Trail as well. Now, I'll tell you, it, it declined, though, the, the whole open range, uh, which there are different theories about why that happened. Uh, but a lot of it had to do with uh, they built railroads, of course, in the Texas later. Uh, of course, a Homestead Act was another reason, which we just talked about earlier. Droughts, um, you know, lack of grazing land was a problem, too, they had as well. I told you how barbed wire was invented. And so all these homesteaders, like the sod busters, came in, and they started to, um, you know, grab the land and break it up. Uh, then we talked about, of course, the stuff that we just did now. Uh, of course, uh, the Homestead Act, I just talked about that. That was that famous act passed under Lincoln uh, that created all these homesteads in the West that were usually around 160 acres, but you had to be at least 21 years old uh, to get the land. And you had to stay in the land for five years uh, and, and like improve it and all that. So you saw the video. Um, only 40% succeeded, uh, but 270 million acres of land was eventually settled uh, due to the Homestead Act. Sawed houses were the kind of houses they settled, I told you about, on the Great Plains because there was a lack of wood or things to build buildings out of, uh, so they used grass sod. And I'll tell you about farming techniques, how they would plow the land like when it would rain or snow or even if they had like frost on the ground. And that would help to uh, leave moisture under the ground. And I told you all the techniques they developed because of the Industrial Revolution, uh, from mechanical, you know, harvesters uh, to windmills um, and so on. We, we already talked about that already it was a few minutes ago. Uh, but that definitely helped things in the Old West. Um, steel plow, you know. I talked about the Oklahoma Sooners, really the Boomers and the Sooners. The Boomers were the uh, first settlers that came into Oklahoma that settled in the 1880s. So they got the name Boomers. And the Sooners were the ones in 1889 that came in and snuck in and took the last land uh, that was still there available, the best land. And they got the name Oklahoma Sooners, which is where the foot college football team gets its name from, by the way.
Now, I'll tell you all the states that got settled, like the last two were, you know, Arizona, New Mexico, and all that, which I guess are here. Uh, that time of the Morrow Acts were those two land grant um, acts passed by the guy, the senator from Vermont, Morrill, remember Justin Morrill, Justin Smith Morrill. 1862 Act created all those mechan a and mechanical type schools uh, that, uh, like LSU, a and Sex A and M, uh, Mississippi State. Then the 1891 created all the African American A and M colleges, like Southern University. U.S. DA told you about that. U.S. Department of Agriculture is important in course regulating agriculture, farming, um, ranching, and also forestry stuff like that. And of course, I'll tell you about the last, already the last states that came in the Union, lower 48, of course, the 1912, Arizona, of course, New Mexico at the end. All right, let's go ahead and move on. Of course, we'll talk a few minutes, of course, about the rise of industry and capitalism. This happens in the late 19th century, mostly after the American Civil War. And uh, what happens is uh, you get this deal where uh, the um, you go from having small businesses to having large size businesses. Uh, and you know much about before the Civil War. Uh, before the Civil War, most businesses were owned locally by either individuals or families. In uh, fact, you would have like a maybe a, a sawmill or a textile mill, and it was owned by someone or a family, and they would run it. And sometimes I call it a mom and pop type operation. And that's pretty much what you had. And then after the Civil War, things began to change. And you have all these companies and corporations that emerge. They take over all the industries. A lot of the people that have small businesses are kind of put out of business. It's kind of like Amazon's putting out all these, putting a lot of businesses out, you know, because of that. Like Sears is not doing well, you know, like it used to. Sears used to be the biggest, you know, store that sold a lot of goods. And but it's been getting put out of business by like Amazon, you know, and so on like that. So it's kind of like the same thing uh, that happened. And um, the people that created uh, these um, industrial companies and corporations were either called uh, a robber baron or they're called captains of industry. It's kind of a debate about which it was. It's like this picture I'm showing you here, but a lot of the lower classes or poorer peoples kind of viewed these people as like people that um, create their businesses in like unscrupulous ways or dishonest ways. Um, so they were called a robber baron, although kind of like the name is kind of, you know, I think wrong uh, because – uh, a lot of these men later uh, helped to really improve the country. They, they created the industrial country and economy we have now today. They made products more easily available. They created a lot of occupations, you know, for people to make a living and things like that. And most of these men, if you really study about all these, like, so-called robber barons that came about, a lot of them came from poverty. They, they, they were poor. And they became very wealthy, which is, you know, the American dream. Uh, there's very few countries like the United States where you can come here and be successful and make a lot of money. And people have done it. There's, I think this country has more billionaires, millionaires than probably any other country in the world uh, overall. Uh, I do have a video I will show you real quick, uh, which is on this topic of, quote, rubber, robber barons. Of course, it goes through some of the famous robber barons that you've probably heard of. You've probably heard of Andrew Carnegie. Uh, you've probably heard of the name Rockefeller, uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt, J.P. Morgan. Uh, those are usually considered the ones uh, that are the most famous. So let me go ahead and show you this film clip. It's on the robber barons. A handful of men will rule business and the nation for half a century with their brilliance and blind ambition. They know no bounds, recognize no authority but their own.
The people were called the robber barons by their critics, and I suppose would be called industrial titans by their admirers, were really the, the agents of the first stage of modern industrial capitalism. Uh, an enormous number of the, of the big corporations that are still a major part of American life were created in the late 19th century, most of them by very talented, very aggressive, often very ruthless individual entrepreneurs. And their achievements are extraordinary. Uh, they transformed the American economy. Uh, but they also did so very often in a very brutal, harsh way, which is what led them to be called the robber barons. The most powerful of these men is J.P. Morgan, the man who finances the railroads and the rest of American industry. He has a vision of a bold new industrial nation towering over the world, and he makes it happen. His origins are hardly humble. His father is a rich international banker who worries over his son's often impulsive judgments. Young Morgan gets a big boost from the Civil War. He sees the conflict as a business opportunity, not a cause, and profits greatly. He'll soon control four of the six major railroads in the country. Banks, insurance companies, industrial corporations, a financial empire worth billions. At a lavish dinner party in 1900, a close associate of Andrew Carnegie convinces Morgan to buy out Carnegie's vast steel holdings. A few weeks later, Carnegie scrawls the asking price of $480 million on a piece of scrap paper. And U.S. Steel, the world's largest industrial enterprise, is created. Andrew Carnegie, unlike Morgan, had not been born with the proverbial silver spoon in his mouth. Carnegie is a genuinely self-made man. From his immigrant father, an impoverished Scottish weaver, young Carnegie learns both the value of a dollar and the importance of social justice. Working as a railroad official, Carnegie grasps a simple idea better than anyone else. You can't build railroads without rails. So he invests in iron, eventually controlling the industry. And when iron gives way to steel, he dominates that industry too. There was tremendous resentment of the way the wealthy used their wealth. That was one reason why people like Andrew Carnegie and to some degree John D. Rockefeller were such conspicuous philanthropists because they were concerned that the wealthy class was going to become a target of national anger if they didn't legitimize themselves in some way in, in the eyes of the nation. That worked for Carnegie. He became, after having been one of the most brutal uh, steel barons of the late 19th century, he became, in the last years of his life, a sort of fuzzy, beloved philanthropist. In his Gospel of Wealth, Carnegie proclaims, This, then, is held to be the duty of the man of wealth, to set an example of modest, unostentatious living, shunning display and extravagance, to consider all surplus revenues which come to him simply as trust funds, to produce the most beneficial results for the community, the man of wealth thus becoming the mere trustee and agent for his poorer brethren. Still, many prominent citizens wonder if the growing gap between rich and poor will do lasting harm to American democracy. All right, it's a little video clip there. They talk about some of them, of course, Robert Barron's, uh, of course, that are famous. Then you go into John D. Rockefeller, but we'll get to Rockefeller later. Rockefeller was really the most wealthy of the Robert Barron's, the capitalist industrialists. He was like the first billionaire. He was worth $1 billion when he died, which is now worth like $6 billion, which is ridiculous. All right. So anyway, um, you know, I'm going to, of course, talk a lot about um, probably it's going to take today's class and then also uh, on Tuesday's class next week, of course, I'll be talking about the industrial age on uh, in the late 19th century. Uh, the first area I usually start in, which is kind of like a weird area to start in, but I usually start in the food industry because they say the food industry was one of the first areas that really industrialized. Most people don't really know that. 
uh, you know, much about that. And um, I don't even heard of, you probably heard of Gail Borden, right? Everybody's heard of Gail Borden. Uh, and of course, Borden milk. You may have had some of the uh, condensed milk uh, before. And uh, Gail Borden was um, this guy who, who lived in Texas uh, prior to the Civil War. They had trouble trying to get sometimes milk. Um, and so um, he came up with this idea to create what they call condensed milk. Uh, and uh, it was mostly became wealthy uh, because of during the Civil War, there was a need in the North for troops to have milk. But, you know, milk would spoil, you know, about that pretty quickly. So this is the kind of milk you could put in cans. Uh, and um, he moved to later New York and became one of the first, I guess, food industrialists, if you want to call it that, because uh, he created, I think, um, condensed milk in 1853. That was when he came up with it. Of course, I had Borden's milk and other products. Uh, I don't know if Borden is doing as well as it used to, but they're still around uh, Borden. I know they make that the Eagle brand. Uh, they make with condensed milk and stuff like that. Other milk, evaporated milk too. Of course, they also have as well. Uh, H.J. Hines. I don't probably think much about H.J. <laughs> Hines, but Hines, of course, also is another guy uh, in Pennsylvania who came up. Actually, it wasn't ketchup first. He came up. He came up with the idea of like um, products where they would can stuff, like canned vegetables, canned pickles. Uh, canned tomatoes and things like that initially. And they started making ketchup, you know, and some of the products like that. And that's what, you know, made, you know, Heinz very, very famous. Uh, they think that Heinz eventually created this product uh, back in the 1880s. Uh, really, ketchup was made at about that time. And then from there, it became real popular uh, and spread to America and then all over the world. So Heinz is one of the first uh, companies or corporations uh, to create like food condiments, uh, canning vegetables and uh, stuff like that. People probably already did that, you know, canning stuff, like especially in the West. They had to do a lot of canning, you know, sometimes uh, put them in jars or whatever. But uh, it was the first mass production of it that happened. Uh, another industry that was big, too, was the meat packing industry. I don't know if you know much about that, uh, but the meat packing industry was really big uh, as well. Actually, the guy I want to talk about first is not Swift. There's a guy named Philip Armour. Right? You've probably heard of Armour, right? You may have bought Armour ham or bacon or whatever. They still have it today. The company's around still. Uh, I guess it's a corporation now. And... Um, Philip Arm was this guy that came up with the idea, uh, and uh, it was centered in Chicago, but it was in like Kansas City, o Omaha, and other places where they, you know, would butcher animals. Uh, and it became one of the first meat packing businesses. Uh, and um, Armour is the one, I don't know if you know it or not, but he invented what they call the disassembly line. You know, you have the assembly line, you have the disassembly, D I S, disassembly line where they would have an assembly line, and you'd have people would just work on one part of the animal to take it apart, uh, basically. Uh, and uh, armor would use everything, like, like say a hog or something like that, like a pig, they would use just about everything with the hog, everything, not just the meat, the bones, the blood, the hide, the hooves, the bristle. Uh, like, I guess they'd use the bristle to make brushes or something like that. And um, armor made a joke once that he said, he made money on every part of the pig, but it squeal. And he said that he was working on it, basically. Um, so that's armor. So he was one of the first guys at meat packing and canning and stuff like that. Um, of course, they create like glue, fertilizer, hair brushes, buttons, all kinds of products, you know, were created from the different animals. Kind of like what the Indians were doing with the buffalo. You know, they did the same thing with cattle and other types of animals uh, as well. Um, of course, also Augustus Swift, he was important. He, he, Swift also had you know the same kind of thing, but Swift came up with uh, the, the idea of using refrigerator cars to ship his meat. He had meat packing plants too, and they would ship uh, meat all over the country. 
uh, using refrigerated cars that used ice and eventually refrigeration now uh, today. So that revolutionized everything, uh, being able to move like bacon around and ham and, and other products uh, to different markets. They also do this with, they do this with fruit. They do this with vegetables um, also as well. So this became a huge national market, uh, of course, using the railroads uh, and all that. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about it later, but there was some, you know, unscrupulous things, you know, about the meat packing industry uh, that was kind of controversial. Uh, you know, there was kind of a dark side to the whole meat packing industry. There was a lack of regulations. So you might have various products that might fall into the food that shouldn't be there. Including somebody's finger, maybe. Seriously, they had problems with that. Just totally disgusting stuff. And it wouldn't be till like the early 1900s when they started creating regulations. You may have heard of that book by Upton Sinclair. It's called The Jungle. It was one of the first books that really uncovered all the negative aspects of the food industry. But um, eventually they start regulating it. You know, USDA and FDA and all that. Uh, things will get better. Uh, but it made food easily available. Uh, there's one thing that's great about this. Uh, on the bottom, too, I've got here another thing that came out also uh, in, um, with the development of, in the late 19th century with the early um, capitalism, I guess. You have chain stores that start getting created. The, the, exactly, I guess the few chain stores you may have heard of that were important were Woolworth. You have the Woolworth, you may have heard of that, Frank Woolworth created some of the first we call five and dime stores, which is now kind of like a dollar general, you know, that you go into and buy different products. And Woolworths were around for a long time. They've closed down now, but uh, Macy's started in the late 19th century was really one of the first department stores uh, they had. And then also later I'll talk about like Sears and Roebuck. That's another one that's famous. Uh, it started out as like a catalog book where you could order stuff and ship it to you. And over time, Sears becomes like Macy's, kind of like a type of chain store as well. So anyway, um, so that's just kind of talking about, you know, the different um, guys, that, different early industries uh, that were there uh, overall. I was trying to think if there's anything I missed uh, in here uh, that were famous, but that's pretty much all the stuff there uh, that I got. Uh, let me go ahead and first talk about, so we have a few minutes left. I can go ahead and talk a few minutes about some of the different robber barons uh, that were famous. Uh, of course, one of the earliest ones they had, you can see all the ones that were big. Uh, you can see here, Andrew Carnegie, Steel, Rockefeller in the oil industry. Cornelius Vanderbilt was in the railroads, also steamships. Of course, J.P. Morgan was in finance and banking, and he also controlled a lot of the railroads as well. So those are the big ones. Those are the big four, uh, the so-called, you know, original capitalists. Uh, they were real famous. Let me talk about at least the first one here, Vanderbilt. We might have time for Carnegie too, but uh, Vanderbilt uh, was originally born in New York in 1794. He did come from a poor background. Just about all these capitalists we're talking about came from a poor background. Uh, they weren't wealthy much, except for J.B. Morgan, I think it was. And uh, he never finished high school or even probably middle school. Looked like he's like 11, he quit at 11. Uh, I think my daughter's in sixth grade. So he quit in sixth grade, uh, basically. And he borrowed some money and he started a shipping business where he, he, he uh, had a ferry. Uh, they would sh um, ship customers from New York City to Staten Island back and forth. Uh, ferry people back and forth. And he made a lot of money. He started doing this like around the early uh, 1800s uh, and all that. And so uh, after that, he developed steamships, uh, Vanderbilt. And so Vanderbilt was later called the Commodore. You've probably heard of. And later on, he, if you know about it, Vanderbilt's famous for founding Vanderbilt University, which is in you know Nashville, Tennessee. And of course, their mascot is the Commodore because uh, of him. He helped found the school. Uh, he's more known for um, developing uh, like railroads. Like he sold his steamships 
uh, was a millionaire, and he started getting into railroad. So they considered Vanderbilt to be the first uh, railroad tycoon, and he controlled like the New York Central Railroad, the New York Harlem Railroad, uh, and so um, he became very wealthy uh, because of that. And then also you can see he was a philanthropist. He gave a lot of money away to charities. And I told you he helped found Vanderbilt University with $1 million. Doesn't seem like much now, but back then that was a lot of money. He wasn't as ruthless as some of the other ones though. later. Um, kind of ruthless, but he was kind of honest compared to some of the other guys. Carnegie was kind of ruthless, and so was John D. Rockefeller. Uh, then you had Andrew Carnegie. Carnegie, of course, was originally from Scotland. So he's a Scottish American who came here at a very young age. And he came to, he lived in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, that's where he would end up. And uh, Carnegie started out uh, working in textile mills uh, as a bobbin boy. And then he saw the video how he worked as a, I think, as a telegraph operator. And then uh, over time, he worked for some various industrialists for like railroads. And um, what Carnegie figured out was that you could dominate uh, the steel industry uh, by controlling all the production of it, like the making of steel and all those resources that go with it. And uh, Carnegie heard about this process in England that was called the Bessemer process. It was invented by this um, British man named Henry Bessemer. And the Bessemer process was a process where they took these huge furnaces and they made steel out of pig iron, which it was like carbonized iron. And so Carnegie borrowed this process and began using it in his plants uh, in America. And so over time, what happened was Pittsburgh, if you know about it, became the center of the steel industry, especially in the United States and originally in the world. That's why like in the NFL, the Pittsburgh team is called Pittsburgh Steelers because at one point that was the big thing, steel back in those days. And um, he had a company. It was called the uh, Andrew uh, the, uh, Carnegie Steel Company, it was called. And um, he eventually sold it uh, to a competitor, which is J.P. Morgan, uh, who bought it for $480 million. And that, that created the first, um, what they call, uh, multi-millionaire corporation, like the first billion billion dollar corporation, which was um, called U.S. Steel, United States Steel, which is still around the day. I uh, took a lot of his money. He gave it away. Uh, I believe the amount of money that he gave away uh, was something like, um, how much was it? $350 million. He was probably worth half a billion he gave away like $350 million or more of his dollars to different uh, philanthropy causes. And died in 1919, um, and um, they had said a famous quote that he didn't want to die a rich person. He thought that was shameful, uh, basically. And so that's why he wanted to give away his money. He said, I started life as a poor man, and I wish to end it that way. Uh, one thing about Carnegie, Carnegie um, is Carnegie Steel Corporation uh, practiced something called vertical integration. And vertical integration is where a company or corporation will control all the processes of creating and controlling the steel or anything it's in. So what Carnegie did was he bought up mines where the iron ore was. Then he brought up trains like uh, railroads. You know, to ship his, his product, like the ore. Then he had his, um, of course, you know, smelting of it. He had plants that would smelt it, refining and rolling of it also as well. So all this was controlled uh, by his own corporations or one big corporation or really company. And um, that's how vertical integration is. Later, I'll talk about horizontal, which is where you control like one area, like one of these here, uh, like John D. Rockefeller practiced horizontal, where he would control, you know, the making of petroleum products, you know, and all that. So um, probably going to stop here for today. Uh, this is a good break point, but I'll finish up talking about 
uh, the rise of industry and capitalism uh, in in the late uh, 19th century. Um, I don't know if anybody uh, has any questions for me uh, right now. Uh, if not, um, of course, let me know later. Uh, remember, of course, you can send me, you know, comments, um, questions about the lecture. Uh, you do get bonus points for that. Uh, and a uh, few reminders before we go today. Um, don't forget, I have two new Canvas quizzes I've posted uh, on Canvas and um, should be in quizzes. And uh, you've got one, of course, on the Coster's Last Stand on that video documentary I gave you from the BBC. Uh, so that there's a quiz on that, 50 points. And then you also got the other one, uh, which is the Canvas quiz on the um, Gilded Age lecture. That one's worth 100 points. Both are due next Tuesday on um, September the 15th. All right, one more thing too. Don't forget also that um, there's one more quiz up. I think there's three people that haven't taken it yet. Um, that, that I see on Canvas, but there's that Canvas quiz on the Reconstruction Era. That's still open right now uh, if you want to take that. So if you haven't done it yet, make sure you get that done. So it's going to close at midnight tonight. So anyway, next week on Tuesday, um, pretty much should be the same time, 1 p.m. Uh, I'll, I'll put out an announcement next later, but uh, over the probably over the weekend, maybe on probably Sunday or whatever. But uh, we'll have, of course, an upcoming lecture, which I'll finish up talking about the age of industry and capitalism in America. Probably talk about some other stuff, too, that time. Uh, and then um, probably that rest that week, I'll try to see if we can wrap up or not for our upcoming first exam. So that's it for today. Um, hope you all have a good weekend coming up. But I'll see you next week um, on Tuesday. Or if you watch us later, of course, uh, make sure you watch us by the weekend. So y'all take care and y'all have a good weekend.